From ABC News, this is an expanded edition of the Weekend Report. Now from Washington for the vacationing Tom Gerald, here is Frank Reynolds. Good evening. For several hours, there have been no official reports of new action in the South Atlantic. But it is not likely that Sunday will be a day of rest. The British say they have close to 5,000 men firmly established in a 10-square-mile beachhead and are moving out to secure more territory. Argentina gives a completely different version and suggests the British are, in fact, hanging on for dear life. And as always in war, the price is life. Both Britain and Argentina have suffered heavy losses, a fact neither country is particularly anxious to stress, as both speak of courage, valor, and glory. We'll hear it all tonight, and we begin in London with John Mackenzie. The Union Jack is flying again on at least part of the Falkland Islands. Getting it there to Port San Carlos, however, required a daring commando landing. In the early hours of yesterday, wave after wave of British Marines stormed ashore. The resistance here, they say, was light, and they were able to take 14 prisoners. By dawn, most of the 5,000 troops were busy unloading tanks and setting up a 10-mile bridgehead. Argentinian planes, however, struck back. Five British ships were hit, and one of them, the HMS Arden, sank overnight. 20 men are still missing, and about 30 are injured. They attacked at low level, and in most cases, pressed home their attacks uh, quite fiercely. I don't believe they had bargained for the uh, response they would get, however, and many uh, Argentinian aircraft were shot down. The British say they downed 16 Argentinian planes. That's more than half the number of Argentinian planes that took part in the raid. On land, their Marines continued to solidify their positions throughout yesterday and today. One reporter traveling with the commandos reports on how they've been received. Some 50 locals, including up to a dozen children, were busy ferrying ammunition to gunners using their tractors and trailers, dishing out soup and tea to the troops and providing much needed shelter. This morning, while paratroopers dig in around the settlement, my section of commandos has been sent out to track down the Argentinians. Without proper clothing and equipment which they left behind, it's thought they cannot last long in such appalling conditions. We are back on the Falkland Islands and back in strength. We intend to ensure that aggression does not pay. Not gave Prime Minister Thatcher's so-called war cabinet a full briefing on the latest military action today. They are all being kept informed, but at this stage, decisions on how to get the islands back are being made by British officers 8,000 miles away. The British were expecting a large-scale Argentinian counter-assault today, but by this evening, the only activity they were reporting was the two British Harrier jets on patrol south of Port Stanley, severely damaged an Argentinian patrol boat. The British now seem confident. The Union Jack is flying in at least part of the Falklands, and they predict it will soon be a common sight throughout the islands. John Mackenzie, ABC News, London. Another of the very few reporters who went ashore with the landing force yesterday morning was Jeremy Hands of British Television News. We have put his radio account together with some still photographs from the scene, and here now is his report. In the darkest hours of the night, we were brought ashore from an assault ship and silently steered through the narrow channels to our predetermined landing beach. There was no sign of the enemy. Then it was a case of getting established ashore before anyone else knew we had arrived. The assault troops spread out fast and dug in over several positions before dawn. By daybreak, the Argentine Air Force had discovered the position of some of the ships that had helped us get ashore. The sounds of bombing raids and retaliation from the British ships could be heard for miles. The troops spent more time this morning digging into trenches than anything else. But the Sea Kings and Wessex helicopters kept their non-stop ferry service going so that the troops could consolidate their position and prepare for the second phase of the battle. The islanders themselves had taken it all very much in their stride. They've been bewildered by the increased activity, but genuinely delighted by the sight of British troops back with them. And they turned out to applaud the raising of the Union Jack at a sheep station. Jeremy Hands, British Television News, in the Falkland Islands. The British people tonight have been told their forces are doing well, but they also have been told of their losses, and they know the price they are paying. The people of Argentina are hearing a very different story, but they too know this is a war of real bombs and bullets, not just slogans and flag-waving. 
We have two reports tonight from Buenos Aires. First, here is Barry Serafin. There has been very little official word in Argentina about today's fighting. Only a few terse broadcast communiques saying the fighting was continuing, declaring that Argentine troops were in control and claiming one British Harrier jet had been shot down. Almost nothing was reported here about air action today, but Argentina's Air Force commander said 72 planes were sent against the British yesterday. About half of them Mirage and Dagger fighter bombers like these, the rest A-4 Skyhawks such as these. So far, the government has acknowledged losing only six planes and three helicopters. Various news agency accounts here depict a British force numbering no more than several hundred essentially bottled up near the Bay of San Carlos. The most dramatic account has the British pinned down on a beach with cliffs in front of them and the sea at their backs. But some government sources today said Argentinian troops had been falling back with reinforcements forced to march across the island. According to those sources, the reinforcements were to arrive tonight and be in a position to counterattack the British tomorrow. The wider war has not yet been seen in Argentina. The most recent pictures released by the government show air attacks near Port Stanley a few days ago. Attacks the British now say were diversionary prior to yesterday's invasion. Argentina's President Galtieri today told reporters that heavy losses are being inflicted on the British, and he blamed Britain's Prime Minister for rejecting negotiations. The blood being shed is not my responsibility, he said. It's the responsibility of Mrs. No, Mrs. Thatcher. After two days of fighting, most Argentine accounts of the war are not as bold as one newspaper headline, Victory. But they portray Argentine military forces as offering stiff resistance, and at least holding their own. Barry Serif and ABC News, Buenos Aires. These days, Buenos Aires is a city of contradictions. It is going through its first real war in anyone's lifetime. And yet, life is going on, separated from the bombings and bloodshed 1,200 miles away in the Malvinas. <laughs> to be sure, the war, if out of sight, is not totally out of mind. These German Argentines rallied around the war effort today, pledging their allegiance to their new fatherland. On the main shopping street, Florida, the volunteers collect money for the boys on the front. And like in every war, somebody is trying to make a peso or two from a tragedy. La Nación is the leading newspaper here, and the crowds usually gather at its offices to get the latest news on the crisis. The headlines were there this morning, but not the usual throng of interested readers. Some of them may have gone to the park to enjoy a crisp, sunny day before autumn fades into winter in the city south of the equator. News from the Malvinas trickles into this capital, and these people know that young Argentines and Britons are dying. But for most of them, the war is still very far away. Bob Rickowitz, ABC News, Buenos Aires. Argentina's Foreign Minister, Costa Mendez, flew to New York today to take part in the continuing United Nations Security Council debate. In a moment, a report on today's UN activity. And in Rome, Pope John Paul celebrates a mass for peace in the Falklands. For nearly four hours today, there was a good deal of huffing and puffing at the United Nations. Nobody's house was blown down, and in terms of moving toward peace, nothing was accomplished. Still, the debate was lively, if predictable. We have this report from Jack Smith. When Argentinian Foreign Minister Costa Mendez left his Manhattan hotel for the UN this afternoon, he was immediately mobbed by a small but enthusiastic crowd of supporters. Costa Mendez's presence here, it's felt, underscores the importance Argentina attaches to the UN Security Council debate as a propaganda exercise. Costa Mendez, who did not speak today, listened as a dozen countries attacked Great Britain, including the Soviet delegate, who also laid part of the blame for the crisis on the US. It is quite apparent that the government of Great Britain would not have embarked upon a solution to the issue with the assistance of the armed force had there not been the agreement and direct support on the part of the United States of America. The delegate from Cuba then accused Britain of piracy, the delegate from Panama of colonialism. Today's debate was supposed to end there, but Sir Anthony Parsons of Britain refused to keep quiet. Obviously, we expected other delegations to give vent to atrociously offensive confused and ill-directed rodomontades against my country. 
Rodomontade is an archaic word meaning arrogant speech. Sir Anthony continued. We also expected to hear the heavy tread of the dinosaur, stirring the dust of long extinct political slogans. Again, we have not been disappointed. I am referring, of course, to the bizarre animadversions we have heard about colonialism and imperialism. Fine sentiments, but as one source here said in today's debate, they are talking into the wind, for it all depends now on what happens in the Falklands. Jack Smith, ABC News, the United Nations. Pope John Paul has sent identically worded cables to Prime Minister Thatcher and President Galtieri, appealing to both for an immediate ceasefire and offering to serve as a mediator. John Paul today offered a special mass for peace and asked both sides to rise above patriotism. In Rome, here is Bill Blakemore. Symbols of peace were emphasized by the Vatican today. John Paul under the white dove, concelebrating the special mass in the chancel of St. Peter's Basilica, with Cardinals Hume and Gray summoned from Britain, Cardinals Aramburu, Prima Testa, and Baronia from Argentina. There was the symbolic kiss of peace. John Paul, in his homily, urged the two warring nations to show magnanimous goodwill before it's too late. He said, it's impossible not to flinch in terror at the prospects of destruction and death. The Sistine Chapel Choir, augmented by British and Latin American seminarians, sang, Peace, give us peace, Lord, in Latin, in English, and in Spanish. John Paul is scheduled to start his trip to Britain on Friday. He's keeping everyone guessing. Central Vatican sources say John Paul is being urged by many to cancel. The Falkland crisis, they say, has already made his trip too political. John Paul says he still plans to go. So the formula for a possible cancellation has now been worked out. It wouldn't come from John Paul, but his churchmen in England. This left John Paul free here in the Vatican this afternoon, publicly to take an unpolitical position. I am the pastor, I am the shepherd. It is my church, and I am expecting that I, I cannot create a political situation. When asked if this meant his visit to Britain would take place, he replied, I have said, I go against hope. Bill Blakemore, ABC News, in Vatican City. Britain's defense minister, John Knott, was asked today, what happens now? 8,000 miles away from the fighting, he replied, we're not going to just sit on our hunkers, we're going to get on and repossess the island. Well, obviously, that is their goal. And our Pentagon correspondent, John McQuethy, has this report on how they propose to reach it. From the beachhead at San Carlos, American analysts expect the British to go after the least defended Argentinian outpost, cutting them off from the main garrison at Port Stanley on the other side of East Falkland Island. The grass runway at San Carlos is expected to quickly become a Harrier base. That will give the British fighter cover all over the island. Although the Royal Navy has lost two warships and several others are reportedly damaged, the British still enjoy overwhelming odds at sea, with more than 20 functional combatants. Argentina now has less than 10 major combatants. Argentina does hold, however, its strongest cards in two areas, numerical superiority in the air. The planes are not all new, and nearly 50 have reportedly been shot down, but Argentina still enjoys a 5 to 1 advantage. And second, Argentina has at least a 2 to 1 advantage in troop strength, and its forces are dug in and apparently waiting. One final factor that will affect both sides is the weather. A nasty winter storm is reportedly breaking over the islands tonight, and that's expected to limit British progress in expanding their territorial gains and will also cripple Argentina's ability to counterattack. With us this evening in our studios is Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, former Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral, if you were running Argentina's game plan right now, what would you do? Would you counterattack? Uh, I would, but I think they're unlikely to. I believe that they will instead send small forces out of Port Stanley to try to harass the British and keep their main forces hunkered down. They are cut off by sea. Their airplanes can't get in. They know that the British Harriers are going to begin to go after them to knock out their heavy equipment. They've got uh, a very tough situation ahead of them. I think they'll be conservative. 
So you think they will sit in their garrison, by and large, in Port Stanley and wait for the British to come to them? With the main forces, yes. Okay. Number two, what would you do if you were in charge of the British operation? I would do, a, essentially, as you have discussed, I would clean out the pockets of uh, Argentine troops on the main uh, East Falkland Island. I wouldn't worry about those on West Falkland. And I would get the high ground uh, up here, well defended. I would uh, use my Harriers to pound the uh, Argentine garrison, knocking out their tanks and artillery and radar and heavy equipment, and uh, gradually tighten the circle on them, leaving them to conclude that they have no choice but to surrender or to plead for their government to negotiate. Thank you very much, Admiral Zumwalt. Frank. Thank you, Jack. Admiral. Tomorrow morning on This Week with David Brinkley, all the overnight developments on the Falkland Islands crisis, Navy Secretary John Lehman and Britain's Foreign Secretary Francis Pym will be among the guests. There was a political event in Montgomery, Alabama today. Some 4,000 people turned out to enjoy barbecued ribs, Southern style, and to listen to the speeches, one in particular. George Wallace formally announced his comeback into politics and declared his candidacy for a fourth term as governor. Wallace is counting on the votes of blacks this year, and today he put the past behind him when he said, regardless of your color, we're all in the same fix. Alabama's unemployment rate is the second highest in the country. Al Dale has prepared this report on the man who wants to move back into the governor's mansion one more time. For months, he has tested the waters and found them warm. The man who served as Alabama's governor three times in the 60s and 70s is poised to try again. Why? Because he says he can do more than anyone to help solve the state's economic problems, including the second highest unemployment rate in the nation, 14%. It has been 20 years since the clash between the civil rights movement and George Wallace's opposition to it propelled the former judge under the American political scene. Today, he has mellowed. In those days, when we had a segregated school system, I stood for it because I believed it was the best. But we found out in Alabama a few years, uh, well, just a short time later, that was not true, and therefore that's gone over in past history. It has been 10 years since he was wounded and crippled for life during one of four runs for the presidency, an ambition he says he no longer has. He insists his health is excellent and that his age, 62, is no problem. But ex-wife Cornelia Wallace says Wallace was not then and is not now physically capable of handling the office. He spent most of his time at home in bed. He was just not well. And I don't think that his condition has improved. The former governor married again last fall, the new Mrs. Wallace, an aspiring singer, 34-year-old Lisa Taylor. But can Wallace win this time? Longtime Wallace watcher John Carroll, a civil rights lawyer, says he can, but he'll need the support of blacks and very likely will get it. I think right now, George Wallace, believe it or not, is the most attractive candidate for black people in the state because he's the only candidate that shows any capability for compassion and understanding of the problems of the poor. Candidates mentioned as possible Wallace opponents in the Democratic primary do not have the former governor's popular appeal. The only other announced candidate is Republican Emory Fulmer, mayor of Montgomery, a tough law and order advocate who has alienated the black community. Right now, as I see it, George Wallace is the best that we've got uh, that I can look at in the state right at this time. When Governor Wallace moved out of the state capitol in 1979, many people considered it to be the end of an era. But George Wallace, the candidate, is back, convinced that he and the Times are right for each other again. Al Dale, ABC News, Montgomery. Last night, the Senate approved a $784 billion budget for fiscal 1983. Although the bill would raise some taxes, it would still leave a deficit of almost $116 billion. On the House side, the debate has only just begun on more than a half dozen different proposals, and at this point, some 70 amendments. The White House had indicated that the Senate plan was acceptable to the President. But today, in his regular Saturday radio broadcast, Mr. Reagan said he's changed his mind. White House correspondent Ann Compton has this report. President Reagan has now shifted his support to a third budget bill for 1983, telling his weekly radio audience a House version that Republicans call the Bipartisan Recovery Act comes closest on defense and domestic spending while preserving an important tax cut that many Democrats want to eliminate. The leadership of the House of Representatives is trying to spend more and to eliminate $150 billion or so of your tax cut. 
Their idea for reducing the deficit, for example, is to eliminate the third year of the tax cut. Democrats are indeed making deficits and that third year tax cut an issue. Basically what's wrong with the supply side program, the program of tax cuts, is that we're trying to finance ourselves, give ourselves tax cuts on borrowed money. You can't go out and say you're in trouble, we're going to borrow money and give our family a, a big amount of money to spend. You can't go down to the bank machine when you've lost your job and the mortgage is due if you've got any sense and say let's put in the money machine and get out a couple of thousand dollars and all go on a spending spree. President Reagan has surveyed the political landscape and decided his best chance for a budget is in the House. He will pull on the same Republican and conservative Democratic strings that brought together a victory last year. This rainy Washington weekend he is spending here at home on the telephone recruiting congressional votes. And Compton ABC News, the White House. 3,600 Northwest Airlines mechanics and baggage handlers went on strike late last night after bargaining broke down over job security and wages. About two-thirds of the airline's domestic flights were canceled, but most of the international flights took off on schedule. No new negotiations with the union have been scheduled. Next week on ABC's World News Tonight, battles rage in the Falklands as casualties mount on both sides. Are the British taking the islands? How long can the Argentinians hold out? Can diplomatic efforts stop the bloodshed? Stay with ABC News, uniquely qualified to bring you the world. Finally tonight from London, something truly different. Walter Rogers reports out...